The operator of Japan's Fukushima nuclear power plant says it might eventually have to dump hundreds of thousands of tons of contaminated water into the Pacific Ocean. It's been three years since the nuclear disaster, but TEPCO is still struggling to clear up, with occasional radioactive leaks still happening. Oh, she has been following the disaster since it began. Technically, we're now well within the Fukushima no-go zone. We're just 10 kilometers from the nuclear power station. These houses ravaged by the tsunami in 2011 still stand here, nowhere near to being restored. One of the frightening things about this entire incident is that there are no concrete boundaries that can clearly guarantee your safety. It's hard to say what gives you a creepier feeling, the trail of destruction left by the 2011 tsunami, or the houses untouched by natural disaster but abandoned after the nuclear accident. Just to give you an idea of the consistency, right now the Geiger counter is reading 3.29 micro ringgits, which is about 30 times what is uh, more than the accepted level. But if you come down here to where the soil and the mud has collected the radiation, it quickly jumps up and it's still climbing. Earlier we got a reading of 99 micro ringgits, which is about a thousand times more than what is the accepted level of safe radiation. The place where I'm at right now, more than 10,000 people are currently living. The earthquake and tsunami which hit Japan in March 2011 led to massive radioactive leaks. Six months later, it turned out that twice as much radiation was released than initial estimates said. By October 2012, operator TEPCO finally admi uh, admitted it uh, failed to implement safety improvements that led to the meltdown. Then, a year ago, record radiation levels were found in local fish. It was revealed three months later that the cause was radioactive water leaking from a storage tank. Last August, TEPCO confessed that around 300 tons of highly radioactive water had leaked from Fukushima since 2011. And Dr. Robert Jacobs from the Hiroshima Peace Institute told us that the cleanup efforts at Fukushima are poorly managed. All that's being done is sort of emergency ad hoc steps to put this water into tanks and there's more and more water every day being put into tanks. Tanks are being hastily constructed. Uh, many people believe it's just a matter of time before all the water held in those tanks simply uh, enters into the ground in the ocean. It's just being done on an emergency basis. It's not being managed with forward thinking and with, uh, with adequate expenditures and equipment. Thousands have been rallying in Tokyo, protesting against the nuclear industry. The Fukushima disaster created up to 300,000 refugees. Robert Jacobs says those people feel abandoned. For public safety and protection, and one of the places that it's easiest to see that is in the treatment of the people, the hundreds of thousands of people that are refugees. Very little is being done for those people, and they're being told that uh, they're going to be moved back into contaminated areas. They're going to have uh, the assistance that they've received for losing their workplace, losing their businesses and homes will be cut off. So at this point, uh, I think that uh, public welfare is, is far from the most important thing being, uh, being supported uh, in Japan. Around three or four people died recently. It will soon be three years since the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear accident. You get depressed when you can't see your future. Many of us are elderly. I wonder if you've thought about people becoming isolated after moving. I bet some people will feel isolated. We've done nothing wrong. Why do we have to move? That's what we want to know.
Late last year, the government virtually gave up on its policy of helping all evacuees return home and extended by up to three years the end of cleanup operations. Some newly obtained data is providing a clearer picture of the nuclear accident at Fukushima Daiichi. It shows how radiation levels near the plant rose before a hydrogen explosion. Fourteen monitoring posts recorded radiation levels every 20 seconds after the earthquake and tsunami that damaged the plant three years ago. The levels started to rise the following day at a post more than five kilometers away. Measurements show radiation began surging at 2.10 in the afternoon. At 2.40, the readings briefly hit 4.6 millisieverts per hour, the highest mark that day. An hour later, there was a hydrogen explosion at reactor number one. Information may lead researchers to new discoveries. We would like to get as much data as possible. At the time, crews were trying to reduce pressure within the reactor's containment vessel, performing an operation called vent work. And Chino says that may have caused radiation levels to rise. A U.S. nuclear expert has stressed the need to prepare for accidents at nuclear plants. The former head of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission told NHK that there is no way to completely prevent them. People have to focus more on the consequences of the accident and look at ways not just to reduce the chance of an accident happening, but to really look at the fundamental design of the reactors to see what can be done to actually prevent or reduce the consequences that we saw from, from the Fukushima Daiichi accident. Yatsuko said restarting Japan's nuclear power plants won't be justified unless the public supports the move. A number of survivors of the 2011 disaster lost loved ones. Many children were among the victims. Some parents have struggled to find a way forward, including a father who lost all three of his kids. NHK World's Mikiko Suzuki has his story. Shinichi Endo makes furniture and other wooden household items. He had three children. His eldest daughter, Hana, was in junior high school. His son, Kanta, was an elementary school student. So was his youngest daughter, Kana. All three children loved their father's work. Kana drew furniture on a piece of paper and suggested that I make it. Kanta told me he'd start helping me when he became stronger. And Hana liked to brag about my work to her friends. Those were happy times while they lasted. Endo and his family were living in the city of Ishinomaki when the earthquake struck. Their house was only about 300 meters from the sea. Endo and his wife took the children to his mother's house next door and told them to stay there. He went out to look for relatives. Then the tsunami hit the city. The next morning, he came home to this. My mother was holding my youngest child, Kana, in her arms. I was relieved thinking she was safe. But the mother said, I'm sorry, Kana is cold. My other daughter, Hana, was also found cold and lifeless. Ten days after the disaster, Kanta was finally found. Endo blames himself for not telling his children to go to higher grounds. 
about a month after the disaster. He received an order to make bookshelves for schools damaged by the tsunami. But Endo had lost the will to work. People started telling Endo his children would be proud of him if he started working again. That lifted his spirits. He accepted the order. They're not here anymore. But they loved books. They'd be really happy to see the completed bookshelves. I realized I could move on a little and have more of a sense of achievement in life. When he finished the bookshelves, he took them to the schools. When I finished the job, I thought how happy I'd be if my kids told me, Dad, really good job. The children's smiles merged in Endo's mind with his treasured memories of Hana, Kanta, and Kana. That pushed him to take on a new project. Endo is now building a wooden bridge and walkway that kids can play on. I'm moving on with my life, with the feeling that my children are always standing by me. I talk to them all the time, saying, watch me. Endo is putting his life back together, step by step. It's a hard struggle, but knowing his children will be proud of him keeps him going. Mikiko Suzuki, NHK World, Ishinomaki.